We were hunted. They would hunt us. Everybody was armed always. And when I went out to patrol the first time, it was me and a bunch of guys from the Mexican army dressed in gray in the back of a truck with rifles, riding around and patrolling, trying to see if we can kill uh, fleas with a hammer, basically. Nothing comes out of China without China knowing. There's no Chinese underworld that, that works outside of the view or influence of the government. It's been a long relationship between China and some of these cartel groups. I mean, they did the math. If you want to make your money disappear, you don't need to grab your money and bury it somewhere. You can give it to a Chinese middleman. People talk about cartel situations. They don't usually think about the avocados they're smearing on their chipotle burrito. We start off with a, with a shootout at 3 in the morning between two rival cartel factions that leaves about 16 dead strewn all over the place. It was chaotic. A lot of people, a lot of our, a lot of, a lot of the people that I came out with died, were eaten by those first for those few, few years. Then I think we're uh, we're off to the races. Ed, thanks for joining me on the podcast, man. I'm happy to have you on here. This will be exciting. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, so slight departure from my normal guest, because unless I'm mistaken, I don't think you do a lot of flying. I, but... I, I flew around in a few helicopters in my past, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but that's a, that's a, we... that, and a few uh, turbo commander, a few jets, you know? Yeah, but that's about yeah. it. Yeah. So we, uh, I, I would like to hear some of those stories for sure. Sure. But um, I, I'm curious, I've, I've heard you on a lot of podcasts. I think Sean Ryan Show is the first one I heard you on. I know you've been on Joe Rogan. Uh, fascinating information that you bring to the table. Uh, as we were kind of talking before we got going, I've talked, I talk a lot about China on occasion with some of my podcast guests. Um, and I think in today's environment, there's things going on just south of our border. There's a lot of stuff going on just south of our border, but Chinese influence that's, that's happening down there as well as with the cartels that you're going to be able to shed sure. a lot of light that people uh, might not realize what's, what's going on just across the fence there. So, can you tell me a little bit about um, just the landscape and what's going on in Mexico and China and some of the geopolitical things that you're seeing? Sure. I mean, I could speak on Mexico uh, specifically. Uh, Mexico right now is at the tail end of a populist leftist presidency that has, um, you know, it started off with the whole notion of abrazos no balazos, which means uh, hugs, not bullets, basically being hands off on all, all cartel stuff. And now seemingly has taken a 180 and it's uh, parts of its military have, parts of Mexico's military has uh, decided to go after factions of the Sinaloa cartel or what the Sinaloa cartel was uh, in the past because it's changing. Uh, what you're seeing in Mexico right now is a very anti-American government trying to prove itself to its citizenship and populace by going at being some, some strong man tactics against some of these uh, smaller cartel groups. Um, they want to prove that they can do their own work, basically. Uh, the U.S. is uh, back to business as usual as far as its uh, foreign policy with, with Mexico. By this, I mean... Uh, you know, you had Trump who would pressure with tariffs, which was not very traditional, uh, but it worked. Uh, but this presidency seems to be doing old school foreign policy stuff in Mexico and it's not working. Um, uh, Mexico has its own connections and political interests as far as cartels go. I mean, they have the, the cartel that they bet on. The U.S. seemingly in the past has had its uh, focus on who it goes after as well. So there's some sort of disparity between both right now. Fentanyl is being pumped into Mexico that makes its way to the United States, obviously. Uh, but their biggest moneymaker right now for cartels, is, at least, uh, is people. People being uh, taxed as they cross the border. It's Christmas for them right now. Um, really? Yeah. It's it's a good time to be a, a, a smuggler, I guess, is, is what you would say. If people, if people want to like get a good look at, at how much business is booming they don't have to go to the border you can go on tiktok and actually see some of these uh, smugglers advertise their services by having you know before and after videos that they post up of people down in mexico gathering and buying supplies at some of these cartel run 
uh, stores, survival stores, basically. It'll, it'll sell you your uh, camouflage uh, uniform, a gallon of water, a backpack full of provisions, and then they'll tax you to cross through their route, basically. And then uh, then they'll post a video of you on the other side. Um, this is done in the open, so there's nobody going after these people in Mexico, obviously. Uh, so what you see in Mexico right now is a, it was a weird, it's a weird stage. On one hand, uh, foreign investment is pouring into Mexico because China is failing as a country. Uh, so the next China, as far as manufacturing and 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 and, and that end, I think it's probably going to be Mexico. Um, you see foreign investment coming in, and the government is like, ah, see, we told you we're doing a good job. But it has absolutely nothing to do with the the the, 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 the policy that the government is doing. It's just that we have a lot of youth, a lot of uh, skilled labor, and uh, companies are moving to Mexico. Um, but uh, Mexico can't go through that uh, that uh, resurgence as a as a as, a, as an economy with, with the cartel situation as it is. That's why I think you're seeing a lot more chatter. On the U.S.'s government side, as far as uh, declaring them a terrorist uh, organizations and mili right. military action in Mexico, it's it's shifting. I think there's something happening. Something's going to happen. I, 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 two years ago, I was on Rogan, and I said that I foresaw some sort of military intervention by beha on behalf of the United States in Mexico. That was two years ago. I said five years. So uh, maybe coming it's coming up. With the piece that I, I don't think you really see that too often up here, uh, north of the border that unless you're really paying attention is the, le I mean, the level of violence, like people hear the cartels are violence and occasion that trickles up, but the number of deaths, um, comparatively, you know, to like being in Afghanistan or Iraq, I mean, it, it's skyrocket. I mean, there's things that, you know, people are outraged when ISIS popped up, but that type stuff goes on with cartels all the time. Am I right? Yeah. I think people get outraged with what the media shows them. And yeah. in a lot of cases, uh, and Mexico suffers from that as well. I mean, jokingly, I can say that, uh, you know, you would see, I remember there was a massacre. So I think there was some sort of a terrorist attack in Paris. Right. And uh, they, a bunch of people in Mexico started, and politicians in Mexico started posting the, uh, the French flag over their profile pictures on Facebook and on Instagram. And obviously Mexicans being who they are, we don't, uh, we don't leave anything, you know, we don't let anything, anything go. They were like, I mean, <laughs> you know, Mexico has basic, that terrorist attack is a fraction of what happens in Mexico every day. You're like, what are you guys doing? Yeah. You know, um, during the first uh, 48 hours of that Ukrainian war, like we, we outperformed uh, the Ukraine a war zone uh, as far as uh, deaths, violent deaths, violent deaths as far as what happened in Mexico. So it's a, uh, it's clearly a war. It's a proxy war, if anything, um, with interest uh, of foreign entities in Mexico trying to do what they do. Um, nothing comes out of China without China knowing there's no, uh, there's no Chinese underworld that works uh, that works outside of the view or influence of the government. So um, all that fentanyl comes from China gets put into the U uh, gets put into the U.S. through Mexico mostly, uh, and nobody does anything about it. Uh, even with COVID hitting, uh, the flow was even bigger, you know. And now you're seeing actual manufacturing in Mexico. You saw that before, but you're, you're, get, you're going into an industrial level of manufacturing now. That's why you're seeing these absurd amount of pill, uh, of uh, fake pain medication pills now being found in these uh, high-level uh, raids on cartel uh, holes in Sinaloa. And no kidding, you're finding, obviously, the, the Chinese uh, chemicals and ingredients that go into it, but also you're finding Chinese chemists, right, working with the cartels. I mean, it's a, down there. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's been a long relationship between China and some of these cartel groups. I mean, they did the math. Uh, if you want to make your money disappear, you don't need a, you don't need to grab your money and bury it somewhere. You can give it to a Chinese middleman and, um, 
They'll put it into the Chinese banking system, through the Chinese banking apps. This has been something that's been already found out by federal agencies in the U.S. We knew about it before, you know, that, that, the U.S. probably knew it about it before, but it was a whole case uh, probably two, three years ago. Uh, but they uh, they make money disappear. You know, they'll put it into a Chinese banking system. The U.S. can't see it and then transfer it back to a Chinese national in Mexico somewhere. And it gets put into the pharmaceutical industry, the tequila industry, the you name it, uh, political campaigns for the mayor of whatever town in Mexico that is uh, being funded by a certain cartel group. Um, so they're very much politicized in that way as well. Uh, and of course, I mean, people can come down to keep people can come down to Tijuana, uh, go down to a lot of the border cities, and you'll see a bunch of pharmacies everywhere. Like, what is the need that great, or is you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a Walgreens every every quarter mile, just different. Yeah, uh, what I mean, it, how prevalent is it? I mean, is it widespread with like Chinese influence there, or is it kind of like one off? And how has that changed over the last decade? I mean, China is definitely going through some sort of some sort of economic downturn. You can see that in in its uh, its waning traditional overt influence in Mexico as far as investments. Like there was a time when Trump declared uh, Mexico being basically personas non gratas, uh, and uh, told a bunch of the companies in Mexico to basically take back their plants to the U.S. I don't know if people remember that. That really didn't affect the economy in Mexico at all. Uh, a bunch of investments came in to fill that void that was left by the U.S., China specifically. Uh, but you're not seeing that, but not not that strong as, as it was in the past. So something's definitely going on. Some sort of downward spiral is going on in the in China right now that uh, that is being seen in Mexico as far as the lack of investments that you would expect. Specifically, uh, since Mexico is a gold rush, basically country right now, uh, but you do see elements of its influence still in the fact that we are now producing, you know, thousands, if not millions, of uh, pain medication that are, is laced with fentanyl, and the ability that some of these criminal groups have now to not only manufacture them in Mexico, uh, but to run some of the uh, chemistry around it. Um, to package it, uh, it was very different. To is very different for the Customs and Border Protection Agency to find a brick of cocaine on a car over somebody's purse with a bunch of fentanyl lace pills in there that have uh, apparently legitimate uh, scripts uh, to do them, or having these pills just be put into a modium tablet or Tylenol uh, bottles and put into a bag and flown across a border. Um. It's just a different game now. Uh, that and, of course, uh, the uh, the uh, the violence that it generates in the local uh, markets in Mexico and how that displaces people, which makes the people move across the border, which also makes them money. Um, so it's just a it's just a very complicated hydra of a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, a million variables that go into it. So it's interesting too to hear the piece of uh, the migrant and problem or the the ramp up of that with the human trafficking piece making money, uh, obviously being a money maker for the cartels. So it's almost like they create. There's so much violence going on, so people want to move, and then they're leaning on the cartels to move them and get them across the border. What if I am someone who is trying to get across the border? What does my you know lead up to that decision look like, and what happens when I say, "Hey, I want to." do that i know there's obviously different variables that go yeah. into what's what's the average what would happen what does that look like i mean it, it, it depends del gato la pedrada is what they say in mexico depending on the cat the size of the stone uh, <laughs> uh but basically they'll they'll you'll probably have a intermediary uh, guy that you'll meet a pollero or coyote uh is, is what they call them polleros means uh chicken rustlers basically and, and uh coyote means a coyote basically uh, all of these people are not independent workers. There's no such thing as an, I'm an independent people smuggler and I work, this is my part of the border. This doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, uh, they usually either work for an organization or pay for protection for an organization, get taxed by an organization. Um, so what usually happens is that they'll see who you are. Sometimes they'll see if you have anything that they, that, that they can gain from you. 
So if you have a family in the United States that is waiting for you, you are going to be charged a bit more probably. Like an, as an example, why? They're probably going to tax your family, or if not, they'll hold you for ransom while, when you cross. So why not? Why why would I want to make five thousand off you or eight thousand off you when I can make more if I just abduct you and hold you for ransom with your family? It's already the U.S. earning dollars and it's already settled, and they're never going to report the crime to any federal agency, which is a big aspect of why people don't see a lot of I oh, hey Ed, this is not none of this is happening in the U.S. Arizona is the abduction capital of the United States. A lot of people get abducted for ransom in, in Arizona, for example, and just nobody hears about it. Why? Because they don't. A lot of these people don't report anything to the police. And that's people. So on this side of the border, they're getting yeah captured. Yep, and just held for ransom. Arizona is the abduction capital of the United States, for example, and people can look that up. Uh, if I if I tell you this. Uh, uh, people dressed as federal police making a raid at how at a house and dragging the people out and then making them disappear in, in, in acid. People would assume that happened in Mexico. Uh, that happened in San Diego, actually. And that happened in San Diego a while ago. Jeez. A while ago. It was probably 11 years ago, I think. Some 10, 10 or 11 years ago. Um, this is happening in the U.S. I mean... You don't hear about it that much, maybe. Some of these things do make the news for, for its uh, level of uh, violence. Uh, but the case can be made for the fact that uh, gang violence in the United States dropped significantly when the Sinaloa cartel actually took over drug distribution in the United States. And it's because they killed off everybody that was making noise. Um, you can you, you can, you can kind of like research that if you want. But it's, it's an interesting aspect of how things happen under the water, as we say in Mexico, in the United States, and just people don't realize. That's wild. Again, I, the only thing that I, I feel like I hear, right? Like you see media and everyone's pumping some kind of, some kind of propaganda, in my opinion, but it's with an agenda. So it's the border and, you know, you have just thousands of people camped underneath a expressway and in tents, or it's when it gets really horrific um, I, I remember, I feel like it was an, a Ford expedition. This is probably like three years ago. I think it was Arizona, but it had like 25 people like jammed in the car and they got hit by a truck yep. and you know, most of them killed. But that's like, it, that's the only time it like, it seems like it boils up over yeah. uh, the, the top there and you hear about this kind of stuff. Yeah. But then, you know, then COVID hits. Right. And, uh, and there's uh, aisles at the supermarket that are stocked with produce. And how is that? How is how is that possible? You know, are illegal immigrants essential workers in the United States? You know, uh, <laughs> because I mean, we didn't see any uh, shortages of that, um, right? So they were pretty much out there working. Uh, so like, the, there there are these weird. I don't know. I, I, I like to call them like lies that lies we tell ourselves. I guess um, you you have a country that just went through a Black Lives Matter, cancel the police. All of the, these uh, things, I, I, I was actually at a few of those protests. I was at the Atlanta one. I was at Portland one as an observer, actually working as an advisor in some of these. And people screaming about uh, slavery in the U.S. Uh, slavery exists right now. And a lot of these slaves are owned and uh, paid and uh, people do business with them and who are cartel members. And... That's a, that's something that people just don't talk about, which is again the whole aspect of at least that's not what the media tells you. You know, you don't hear, right. you, you don't hear these things. I cup, I, I uh, speak about these things uh, often, and I get yeah, uh, I, I, I get uh, I get some attention because of it, uh, but not a lot, realistically. I mean, not not the traditional media. And what you're talking about, it's. Again, I think what probably most people just assume that people working out uh, in the field picking produce are there willingly. But is that what you're talking about? I mean, they're essentially some of them. Some of, some of them are paying. Uh, some of them are paying debts. Uh, the the amount that you have to pay somebody to cross you uh, to get you across the border varies. There's no guarantees, but what is guaranteed is that you're going to pay for it. 
That's that is guaranteed. Something you hear told by immigrants constantly. You know, the guarantee is that you're gonna pay for it, you know. Um and uh some of them uh eight thousand, ten thousand, five thousand. You know, you hear different numbers, some even well, absurd numbers like fifteen thousand. Uh people basically crossing the border and being held in in a working situation. And obviously they're here illegally, so they can't uh, do a lot as far as uh, reporting their uh, bosses or, or or the situation to anybody. And they basically just work off their the, the debt that they have for a year, for two years, even more sometimes. And that is that is basically indentured slaves, uh, slavery. Basically, they're 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 uh, they're they're being held uh, in these places uh, against their will. I mean, they don't want to be there. Man. Uh, again, these things don't get talked about. When people talk about cartel situations, they don't usually think about the uh, avocados they're smearing on their Chipotle burrito or uh, the wine they just picked up uh, from the uh, uh, Go Governor Newsom's uh, winery in California that was open during the COVID epidemic uh, uh, with a bunch of uh, people working there illegally, basically. This, these are things that you just don't. You don't, no one talks about you don't put together, basically. Yeah. How, what would you assess, you know, now versus 10 years ago versus 20 years ago, uh, better, worse, no different, just kind of the overall situation, or is it just, is it different? I, I think it's worse. I mean, the numbers don't lie. The amount of Mexicans dying violently in Mexico, this is the worst year to, this is the worst uh, presidency uh, the most dangerous presidency as far as the Mexican goes, you know. Uh, the amount of people missing and dead in Mexico is astounding uh, under any metric. The amount of uh, uncovered corruption that has been seen not just by current administration, but just by past administration. Uh, so, so one of the administrations that I served under, uh, uh, the head of the national the, the national security office basically just got a just got uh, sentenced uh, just got uh, convicted in the United States. Uh, Luna was that the drug czar? Was it like two thousand five? And then he just he got arrested in yeah. mid teens and then just convicted. Yeah. So I mean, he was the, he was the drug czar, like he was, in charge of it all. He right? was in charge of everything counter cartel related in Mexico when I was active uh, part of the part of the time that I was active and. Uh, all of us, I mean, I got uh, polygraphic, like uh, polygraphed, uh, FBI background check, drug tested, psychological evaluations every every year, sometimes every six months. Uh, and all of a sudden, this guy that got all these awards from the FBI, the uh, State Department, uh, pictures with Hillary shaking hands, um, is uh, apparently that he was uh, apparently he was in the pocket of the uh, Beltran Leva cartel. Uh, and it's uh, the, the the amount of corruption in Mexico and the United States here that is being uncovered by this because there's no way this drug czar guy that was just convicted it could have done what he did without anybody knowing about it. I mean, it's absurd. Uh, but uh, it tells you a little bit about what influences are in power right now and who is out of favor with the influence that are in power. But the amount of corruption basically that is being uncovered it's, it's alarming if this is what we don't if this is what we just found out what else are we going to find out and uh you know how how uh how deep it goes because how uh, so now i kind of want to jump back into uh, the beginning of your career and talk about that because I've, I've heard you talk about this and to me the organizations i've been a part of it's everything is so dependent upon being able to trust the guy to your left and right. And if you can't trust them when you're going to go across the line, I mean, you don't, you don't have anything. So how, like, so how, how do you operate in an environment like that? I mean, I just, uh, I just uh, uploaded an interview I did with my former boss, uh, which was surreal to talk to that guy. Uh, uh, it's the first time I ever shake this hand. Um, and I worked with that man for years uh, because that there was that uh, separation as far as him being the the boss or the commander, basically, and me being one of the, the grunts on the ground. Uh, 
he is an example of how things can be or should be. Um, very straightforward guy, smart, highly trained, educated. Uh, there's documentaries on the on the guy. He basically took Mexico from the most dangerous city list on the, on the planet to, to taking it off. Did the same in Juarez. Um, he is an example of what could be, you know. Uh, but the problem is that most of the people that are, were around, or a lot of the people that were around, were not that. Um, they were people that were a product of the old school of way, the, think, uh, the old school way of thinking in Mexico. So when I was coming into that career, uh, I was lucky enough to have a mentor, leadership figure in Lizola, not just setting up the training that we did and how we were trained up, but also leading us when we were actually on the street. But that didn't last. And usually in Mexico, things uh, go by in sequences of five years, which is the presidential cycle. Okay. So somebody comes into office and has this amazing experimental police program where they're going to take uh, young unmarried people that have no attachments and basically can father. <laughs> I train them, train them in all the things they're going to train them in. Uh, basically turning uh, what was traditionally a, a, a police academy into a paramilitary academy, which is what he did, and treated this uh, cartel problem uh, more like a guerrilla warfare or counterinsurgency is what he did in a lot of ways. So divide and conquer aspect of it was pretty insane and impressive and successful uh, for, for all intents and purposes. And he made a few individuals like myself who were true believers, as you would say. Uh, but there's, that's not the norm in Mexico, sadly. Um, five years came and went. Uh, there were some situations that he didn't see were fair or on the up and up, and he left. And when he left, all of the rules, uh, countermeasures to keep people honest, all that stuff basically just lifted. And all of a sudden, I was—I found myself in rooms with people that we had investigated for cartel ties five, six years ago. They were back on the job, you know. So this, this is this is Mexico, basically. Every five years. That's so crazy. And I mean, when you're doing going out doing raids and things like that, I would imagine operational security, the concern of like knowing. Like, how did you know this guy's not spilling or he's on the books? Trust no one. Like, trust no one, you know? for That was the, the rule was trust no one. The trust trust no one was like a thing I learned early on. Uh, comp comp compartmentalization. Uh, it was some people knew some things. Other people knew, like, some people didn't know anything. Uh, uh, it, you, you can trust a lot of people. I mean, the local cops in Tijuana. You know, we're, we were uh, we were a state organization originally. So we would go into places like Ensenada, Rosarito, these are small municipalities, and we didn't, the cops and the cartels were the same thing. You know, we couldn't trust them. Um, the military sometimes was working one faction or the other in some places. So we couldn't trust them. So it, it, the trust was a, a big issue and a big factor. And again, you, they would verify us to the max. Uh, I actually went under uh, underwent uh, two training cycles in Coronado in San Diego. When I went to do that, they verified everything uh, that they could off us. I mean, we were. Uh, I got to see some of the planes taking off. Uh, ta uh, some of the planes with the Red Star taking off uh, North Island, if you know. Okay, uh, probably some Hornets. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I remember seeing that, and uh, and then just being told that. Uh, it's wild that we are allowed to be here, uh, being who we are and where we're from, basically, you know. Um, and uh, we went through all that and had a lot of FBI background checks. Again, all the countermeasures done to us. And it turned out later on in life, when, when I mean, imagine me going through all of that and then watching TV currently and seeing the head of everything that I was uh, working uh, for being uh being charged uh in the united states for basically law basically being a cartel uh, member uh man it was wild um 
That would be wild. And also me be, I know you're removed from it, but it'd be demoralizing, I think, to definitely a certain extent. I wonder, I read uh, Secretary Gates, he was the Secretary of Defense, um, I guess under, was it Obama or Bush? But he wrote a book, and one of the first things he was talking about day one in the Pentagon, like he went to the bathroom and some aide came running after him because he had to do a drug test and they wanted to get him to do his drug test. But you know what? Like at, at certain levels, it's, you know, these guys telling these, you know, everyone below them, here are the rules, you know? Um, and you, you wonder how vetted are they? Do they have to comply with it? Are they doing the, every six months doing a polygraph test or, you know, they're, they're interfacing directly with the FBI or CIA or whoever DAA, and they're like, yeah, he's good. Like, of course. So we're not making him. I, 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 I assume that like when I was working there, I assumed that that would happen. You know, <laughs> like I, I, I went, I went through some of this stuff. Uh, I, I got to visit, visit the state department back in 2013. All right. Um, as part of, as part of, a as part of, of a border, border government, uh, thing that they wanted to meet with a bunch of officials and stuff like that to talk about some issues on the border. And I went through uh, it's the state department. Of course I went and I'm, I'm a cop from Mexico. You think I didn't go through all these things. Um, and, uh, a lot of the people that I was in that, uh, in, in in that in meeting with her now in custody, some of them were border border governors, you know, and you would assume that a lot of these people had to go through the same checks and balances, but it's just not the case. Um, what should outrage Americans specifically about that is, uh, and I'll include myself in this because I've been paying taxes for a few years up in the United States now, and ouch, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, is that we, all of us with our taxes are paying for everything that goes on in Mexico as far as government uh, efforts against cartels, and we have so ha, we have been paying for it uh, for decades now. I think uh, there's a there's a there's a bilateral agreement between Mexico and the United States where Mexico where the United States basically outsources the drug war to Mexico, pays for. Trucks, uniforms, firearms, training, um, just sends money down there basically for it. And, uh, you know, I started my career in 2004. And when I went out to patrol the first time, uh, it was me and a bunch of guys from the Mexican army dressed in gray in the back of a truck with rifles, riding around and patrolling, trying to see if we can kill uh, fleas with a hammer, basically. Um, and guess what they're doing right now as far as uh, counter counter cartel operations in Mexico? Is that the, it's probably the exact same thing it's today? exact same thing. And it's not working. It hasn't wor ever worked. And we're still paying for it. If you had uh, the ultimate say <laughs> and uh, whatever resources you need, how do you fix this? Uh, it, do you, is it fixable? Uh, number one, uh, I mean, as far as what the U.S. can do, I'd say audit the money that is being spent closely and clearly. Uh, from having worked in Mexico for the government at a high level um, and now not working for the government in Mexico and being in the United States and being uh, working for the private uh, sector, Although I do also do training for the for the government military as well, I could tell you without a doubt if I I, I wouldn't trust anybody in Me the Mexican government or the military to do anything uh, uh, related to making things better in Mexico as far as the cartels go. There, even 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 according to their own documentation. Again, people, this is not my opinion. This is, you know. People can look this up. Uh, there, there, there was a giant uh, document leak, uh, Mexico's version of WikiLeaks, uh, called the Guacamaya leaks. Uh, basically, a bunch of the, the Mexican army's documents got leaked. When I say a bunch of them, like eleven million pages of it, uh, and people are still <laughs> people are still looking through them. Um, it, within these documents, they themselves say, "Well, uh, this." Uh, this this uh, command region over here seems to f when the 
command region over here seems to favor the Xenolog cartel. This command region over here seems to favor the new generation cartel. Uh, officers from the military here work for this side. Officers from the military here work for that side. So they themselves realize that within their ranks, there's influences and, you know, they work from one side or the other. Uh, so it's a corrupt organization in a lot of ways. It's gone. It's far, it's too far gone now. Uh, it used to be that the you would see tra traditional see, traditionally see the Mexican Marines used. They use them for El Chapo, the the raid for El Chapo. They use them for a few high level arrests. They were they were they were seen as more trustworthy, uh, and the U.S. used them a lot as a proxy organization and to do operations in in, the, in in Mexico. And the government basically got wind of it, and they, they're not. That's why you don't see the Mexican Marines being utilized as the tip of the spear anymore. It's a middle figure to the U.S. by the Mexican government, basically. Um, it's, 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 it's Mexico, Mexico's government and uh, military seem to be just too, they're too rooted with this, uh, with this problem in Mexico. And I mean, it's, they're, they're too far gone. The, the fact, you know, one, you like follow the money. So audit, yeah, the unfortunate piece, I think it, I mean, it was this right before nine 11 when, um, Rumsfeld said, you know, they did a DOD audit and they're missing a, a trillion dollars or something like that. Um, so even us following our money, you know, that stuff is still pervasive today, which is unfortunate. But then the, you know, the other fact, too, is like just being a human being. I can't imagine. Right. But I'm trying to like empathize. Like if you plot me down somewhere in Mexico and you're either faced with uh, obviously hardships with trying to make ends meet on the flip side too, the threat of violence against you or your family in like a horrific manner. So like if you find, I imagine if you find yourself between the cartel and one of their objectives, it's either two options. Like you either are kind of bought off and you're complicit in helping them do with whatever they need to get to their objective, or they just remove you via violence. Like yeah. that seems like that's the two, two courses of action. Not all Mexico is very violent. There's some parts of it that are weird. There's some parts of it that are bad. There's some parts of it that are controlled by the cartels. Uh, there's some parts of it that are legitimately controlled by the cartels because they not only own the polit politicians but the, and the police in the region, but they also have the uh, military paid off or have some sort of high-level agreement with the with the government. Um, the relationship between the factions of the Sinaloa cartel and the current federal government in Mexico are clear. I mean, he's... Uh, the El Chapo sends messages through the press to the president of Mexico, you know, so it's, and the president has interceded for El Chapo's family. So family members can actually see him at the Supermax uh, facility. Uh, there is uh, legislation going on as far as having El Chapo x-rayed back to Mexico. They don't want to send El Chapo's son to the United States or blocking all efforts to extradite. Um, it's a shit show. It's a, it's 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 a shit show. Uh, um, Mexico, like, again, I don't see any solution that includes the Mexican government as it is right now, including the military. Man, it's wild too. You just don't you don't hear about it that much. At least I don't think you hear about it that much. I want to back up. What got you involved in policing in the first place? Uh, no choice. <laughs> lack of uh, lack of real choices. Uh, I was on year two of a medical uh, career. Like I, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, this is early 2000s, 9-11 uh, hit, and it just made the economy just go into the toilet on the border. So I didn't have a lot of choices. A lot of my friends uh, started uh, arriving to parties in fancy cars. Uh, uh, I remember one of them uh, got uh, to a party he went from a skateboard to a Dodge Ram with a white line, or a blue Dodge Ram with the there was race stripes on it. Okay, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I remember him get, uh, coming to a party with that thing in a little kangaroo pouch with a with a gun in it. Uh, this time I was trying to get a job at a call center <laughs> or just to, to just to earn some money. Yeah. Um, and he told me about this massive opportunity you can have. You work for these guys that are hiring people, you know? 
And uh, I saw an ad in the newspaper for this uh, experimental police group, and I I decided to take that bet, I guess, <laughs> instead of the other. Yeah. Instead of the other. <laughs> instead of the other. I think my family saying that I couldn't, I, I couldn't bear with the bear, bear through the training and basically betting against me. I think that's what motivated me the most. I was a punk. I was a punk kid. I used to skateboard, uh, have crazy hair. So nobody. Nobody in my family really believed that I was going to be a cop, be, be, be a cop uh, or, <laughs> and in Mexico is very different. It's not like, it's not, it's not here in the U S where like being a cop means, you know, the different thing in Mexico. It's like a thing to be ashamed of in a lot of ways. Like a lot of people in my family didn't know I was a cop for a while. Like it was, it was, it was kept from me. <laughs> is that because of the threat of like with cartels and things like that? Or just, just the shame of it? You know, yeah, really. Man. It's, a, some, some, it's, it's a it's a nasty thing to be in some places. Uh, uh, the the stigma of the job and how hated it is in some parts of Mexico and uh, some segments of society. It's just so they all of them betted against me. Like, oh, you're not going to make it. Uh, you're going to drop out. And there there was a there 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 was always already this uh, notion of how brutal the training was, uh, and it, it was pretty. Horrific, uh, but uh, they had this open door policy there. So if you go there, they, the door was always open. Basically, you could fucking get out. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was. Uh, I saw an ad in the newspaper, uh, and I put my paperwork in, and I didn't think they were gonna, I wanted to get, I was going to get called back. And six months passed, and finally they called somewhere. They say you're. You're in in January, so get your shit together, basically. Yeah. How long was the training? I, I imagine you probably had a couple of background checks and things like that, uh, this initial screening. So uh, FBI background check was part of the initial screening. Uh, oh. Uh, so Is that for, like, I mean, at the time, or is that still the case for, like, all police? That was, like, a new, like, it was like they, were, they were trying okay. new things, basically. So, and, and that takes a while. So... You were you you would see people during training being basically pulled out because something came back, <laughs> like a, towards the end of it. You know, uh, it was uh, s six months of training supposedly. It's more more like seven, uh, okay. seven months uh, paramilitary training. It's not. It's not. I thought it was going to be like the you know, police academy movies, and it was not that at all. <laughs> they lied. They lied. You know? <laughs> uh, it was a uh, paramilitary training inside of what used to be a prison. So it was a. They made this prison out in the hills, and they realized that there's too much fog in that area. So they abandoned the project. Uh, and then they said, "Well, it's not good enough for a prison, but it's good enough for a training compound." So that's that's where they kept us. <laughs> Oh, it's the simple joys, man. It's the simple joys in life. So you, you, you go through the training and then what were like some of the first couple of years like? And then it, it seems obviously you really kind of went down the uh, the path to what you're doing today. Yeah. But I imagine that kind of built. So what was what were those first couple of years and what did it lead on to how you're sitting here? Today? I mean, uh, basically, they were they were trying to rush us through some of the training. Uh, uh but they need bodies, you know, they need people more than, you know, they need that more than meeting standards. So, yeah. So I remember coming out to a city, a state, basically like a whole state in chaos, but specifically a city, Tijuana. Uh, while we were inside, there was a bunch of firefights that happened uh, with federal agents, basically trying to come to Tijuana and take control of the situation. Not, uh, not happening. So we were cut. We're, we were uh, under trained, under equipped. Um, not really clear about what we we're going to do, and the people that were in charge, or the old people outside waiting for us, uh, had a year experience themselves. You know, so yeah. So, <laughs> so like no, nobody, nobody, uh, nobody knew what the fuck they were doing. Basically, so oh, blind leading the blind. What can go yeah, wrong? Yeah, I remember coming out. Uh, and uh, getting uh, a, a soft uh, armor second chance vest that was probably secondhand as well. 
um, <laughs> getting trained with a Beretta 92 FS pistol, and then get, get getting a Glock, which I'd never even seen before. Um, uh, it's, it's just random, just basically, like I realized as soon as it got out, it's like, it's like when you grow up, you know, and you realize that grownups don't exist, like nobody really knows what the fuck they're doing. So I had this, <laughs> I had this idea that if somebody out there had their shit together and was going to kneel like, but nobody did. Turns out <laughs> no. no. Uh, we went out uh, and we had, we, we, all of us were young. That's a, a thing, a, a thing that I kind of like, it's kind of dawning on me recently. Um, I actually went back and actually got to visit the academy that I came out of and talk to some of the younger guys coming through the training themselves and how different it is now. Uh, but we we're all a bunch of kids. The the oldest uh, the the my like my region my my commander coming out was twenty five. You know, 20, 20, 24, 25. I was twenty one. Right. We we're all kids. All of a sudden, we we're all kids with uh, full automatic rifles riding around the most dangerous city on the planet, doing the most dangerous job on the planet, according to some back then. And uh, we were the you know, you would hear this this ruckus on the radio or this report of eight vehicles with the armed personnel driving through downtown. Please, like, who's going to respond? Nobody was. Res- we were the ones that would go. Why? Because we're stupid and young and idiots, basically, and we were being led by young idiots. Um, so it was it was chaotic. A lot of people, a lot of our, a lot of a lot of the people that I came out with uh, died or eaten by those. First, for those few few years, um, this you know, it's kind of funny. And I mean, it, it, the aspect of being young and what you were doing. I just did an interview with a buddy who's an F thirty five pilot. I don't know if it'll air before this one or or after it, but we were talking about the uh, flanker that hit the drone. You know, made made the news yeah. right. And then the joke of that was, you know, if it's anything like our military, like if you go out there and a four ship of F-16s or a four ship of F-22s, like the average age of that formation is probably like 27, maybe. You know, you got a guy who's a guy or guy who's like 24 and you probably got one leading it who, who might be like 28, maybe 32. But what those guys did and you know, like you look at him like one, like who's going to hit a a drone wants to hit a drone with a plane, <laughs> but the geopolitical strategic impacts of basically two yahoos going out there and doing something like can start world war three. It's kids. Uh, and, kids. Yeah. It's kids. And that's like every, and everything. It gets kind of funny. You say it's like, ah, I think there's gonna be a grown up here one day and it turns you out. Know. No. And then it's just a bunch of kids going out here and doing things, whether you know, patrolling the streets, flying the skies. It's I remember this, uh, somebody handed me a grenade launcher. Like, here's this grenade launcher, right? We're going to do something. Here, here's this grenade launcher. And so in my mind, I was like, I wouldn't trust myself with this, you know? <laughs> and also, no, I was never asked if, was, if I was qualified with this object. You know, I had, to, I had to grab it, put it on my knee, take out my phone, and Google it, basically. That's awesome. Right? This is the level of just nobody knew what the fuck they were doing. Uh, but there, there, a figure came to us uh, in the form of Lazola. Um, he was basically, in tr- he formulated what the training would be. He formulated what the police agency that was I was a part of was going to be. But he wasn't there to receive us when we came out of the training. Not yet. Uh, he was still off doing something uh, something else. Uh, but when he came, finally came, he was like, uh, he was like uh, Gandalf on that second day, you know, you know, <laughs> the white, the, the white, com- the white, uh, the white wizard just coming on that, uh, second day, like legit. That's how it felt. Uh, when he, uh, when he got all of us together and basically said, apparently nobody's in charge. So I'm going to be in charge now. Um, the first thing he did was, uh. He realized that there a lot of the, the a lot of the, the efforts to keep us honest uh, only function until the end of training, and then when we we're out, we we're pretty much uh, left to our devices in a lot of ways. Uh, so 
there was a there was a, cl- a cleansing uh situation happening at early on and people were asked like uh are you here for like are you here to work or are you here to work for somebody else basically okay. would people be honest about that or is it something one day they roll up in a dodge charger and you're like i mean uh, t- like yeah. i have this uh story like I, I i've only owned a single vehicle my whole life uh a 92 f-150 truck right yes. uh, that's this is the only car i've ever owned uh and uh, I had people showing up with a like a, I remember a dude one of the guys that I used to work with showed up with a yellow uh, Hummer H two Hummer to work. Like, okay. huh, huh, huh. And I just saw I just saw this thing just roll by, you know. <laughs> uh, and I was like, okay. But then you know I realized that a lot of the leadership was compromised and. But that changed when Lee Zola came, kind of came into the picture. Um, he, get, he emboldened us, basically. He said, hey, uh, what do you guys need? Well, we need training. More training. More training. Uh, we need advisors. We need to ask people that know their shit what to do, basically. We need weapons. Uh, we were... Uh, sometimes we were rolling around with a 9mm AR-15 and maybe two... AR-15 supporters, the, the long ones. And that was it. You know, our handguns, and we were going, go, going and getting to shootouts with people with uh, uh, AKs and stuff like that, and we were just, like, outgunned. Uh, so, he basically came in and armed us. I think we were probably the first organization, of uh, policing organization of its kind in Mexico that, that had, that was supplied with these military-grade battle rifles uh in the form of g3 battle rifles basically uh yeah. so we were like we were asking for policing weaponry and we were giving battle rifles uh full automatic g36s uh, mp5s uh, FA, fn fals every now and then uh you would see this uh in the training that we got we were like oh they're gonna bring in an lapd swat guy or or somebody of that nature to show us how to police in Mexico. And it was people coming off uh, deployments in Afghanistan. Uh, NS- no NSW kidding. people that uh, had been out there and done shit and come back are like, well, this is what's worked, it worked out there. See if it works in, in Tijuana, which is basically a war zone of itself. So let's, we found more in common with them than with like traditional police, uh, police officers in, in the United States, you know, as far as their, War fighting experience because we were doing the same basically in a in a city. I know it probably varies. You know, you hear the sensational stories, uh, like I mean, you know, big big gun battles and things like that, just knocking down in the street. It was that something you found on a routine basis? Is that kind of like the one off that makes the news, or what is what is an average day might, might look I mean, like? Uh, I know it probably uh, varies. In, but... in my mind, I would always keep it week to week. Like we would have these okay. uh, these uh, in work weeks, basically, uh, and it was you know you I mean I'll, I'll go over like I think one of my most memorable weeks I, I guess uh, we start off with a with a shootout at three in the morning between two rival cartel factions that leaves about sixteen uh, dead strewn all over the place. Yeah, when we got there, we were you know, there was a few guys on the ground with AKs just laid on the ground, and reports of shooting all over the city because they spread out from there. So these are people dressed as soldiers, people dressed as federal police officers, people with actual that were actual cops in marked vehicles in that shootout. So how do you deal with that? You know, and we get there and like who's who. Um, pick up those guns, don't leave them here. Kid is going to pick them up so that we have a truck, uh, the truck is full of AKs covered in blood and brain, brain matter. So that's the start of the week. And then Jeez. A, f- a few days later, there's a s- shootout at the uh, downtown Tijuana, uh, abduction of a, a, a businessman. And it uh, makes the news and he's friends with a politician, so he gets extra attention and now all of us are basically going door to door and uh, visiting every single known offender in the past 
uh, for the next uh, three days. So and there's, there's no thing as there's no such thing as sleep. So there's sleep in the car, or take a nap in the hotel for a bit, and then go back out. Um, then there's prison riots that you have to attend because that's another responsibility that we have as a responding uh, agency. Uh, and then there's eradication shit we have to do in the middle of Ensenada somewhere, uh, some of the hills in Ensenada, and being flown out there in a helicopter uh, to try and figure out to figure that out. Uh, so it was it was uh, it was insane. <laughs> it was it was an insane time. Uh, um, it's uh, the 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 tempo of it was uh, pretty surreal. Been thinking about it now. How, and it's not like you were moving yourself at night, going home and relaxing. No. Like you're living in that environment, so like the switch is never turned off. Oh no! How do you deal with it? How do you deal with that? Uh, hotels, we would say hotels, uh, army barracks. Uh, every now and then, a group of us would rent a house or an apartment, and we would basically do that to kind of keep ourselves safe because we were hunted. They would hunt us. I mean, there's uh, money out there for for a badge, uh, uh, so that there there was that 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 was always a worry. A few a few of our guys got picked up uh, after work, and uh, that was always like a worry. So you never turned it off. Uh, you we would have a buddy system. Uh, would check in regularly. Everybody was armed always. Uh, the need for figuring out how to get out of uh, trying to get abducted was apparently clear there, which led to me now doing what I do as far as an instructor. Um, but uh, you, you never turned it off. I mean, uh, this, uh, I, I every now and then I, on my social media accounts, I, I uh, share some of these uh, journal entries or therapy uh, notes that I, that I as far as, uh, after I got out, uh, you know, the I've been going through a lot of uh, therapy and trying to figure things out as far as the experiences that I had and how to get better, you know? I've been very open about my process. Um, I have this vivid memory of waking up in the, I thought it was the middle of the night, you know, uh, seeing an AR-15 like on the, on, on, uh, on the wall, seeing one of our guys outside smoking, you know, uh, outside the window smoking, basically a fire watch. And uh, seeing another dude in full kit, basically is uh, laid out in the couch asleep he doesn't want to get undressed because it's he only has a few hours you know so it'll just yeah. open the belt and unbutton and take off his shoes and that's how you would uh rest uh so i describe all of these things that i was seeing as i woke up and uh, i remember just uh looking at the clock and realizing it was only 10 a.m and 10 p.m and i had the whole night to sleep through so it was i remember that uh, when i was ask what a good day was or, or a good moment was for me back then. I think like, stuff like that was a good moment for me, you know, realizing that I had the whole Jeez. night to sleep uh, and feeling safe because there was a bunch of dangerous ass men around me with guns. And I was one of them, you know. And you operate in that environment for years, yeah. right? It's 12 years of that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're out of it. So that's obviously what's uh, wrong with a lot of uh, American servicemen as well. You know, it's, I think it's probably a problem. It's, it's old as war. Uh, you can, right. it's very easy to put people in war. It's hard to take them out of it. Yeah. I mean, the traumatic stress, the things you're seeing and you're doing it day in and day out. I've heard guys talk, you know, like we compared to like first responders uh, versus soldiers. Again, there's some apples and oranges. Both are seeing, Tough stuff, but with a soldier, at least you're detaching and you're coming home. I mean, there's still a lot of problems you have to deal with, but if you're you know, first responder, you're driving past that street corner, you know, taking your kid to school, like you're never removed from it. And then your scenario, obviously, I'd say, obviously even tougher, like you're being hunted and you're, it's, yeah. you're hunted and then you're hunting and it's just on and off, yeah. you know? That's it. And it's, uh, I remember this, uh, that movie, The Patriot, when, uh, with, with, uh, <laughs> he talks about wars being fought uh, amongst amongst your houses uh, between people that share your same faith and language. 
you know, uh, yeah. speaking to some of my friends who are like veterans of the U S wars, like a lot of them, like a lot of people ask me like, Hey, you had to like, uh, like you talk about therapy and all the things that you're going through. Like you, I had amazing post-traumatic uh, stress disorder instructors in all the servicemen that I met in the U S. Um, it, uh, it is definitely something that is heavy. And I, like, I recognize in a lot of, uh, my American, uh, brothers and sisters that have come back from some of that experience. And I, yeah, you can get it, uh, from being, I mean, any, and any law enforcement agency in the U S some of them see a lot, some, some of them see as kind of the same, some of the same things that I saw down there. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to turn that off or what it changes inside of you is hard to deal with after you're gone. You know, like, uh, for me, it was, uh, alcoholism. I, I see some of that in the U S as well. Uh, broken broken marriages uh just uh physical maladies manifesting themselves over you know sleepless you know nightmare filled nights that, that some people get after going through some of that shit um and you know uh a big aspect and a lot of the reason why I do what I do and uh, and talk about what I talk about is that uh, the difference between somebody coming back from the Middle East and uh, c coming home is that, well, there's no coming home for a lot of people, you know, on my end. You know, they are home. Uh, and they're voiceless. There's not a lot of voices like that uh, out there for people. Like, I mean, if I ask anybody out there nationwide, how many ex-members uh, of Mexican law enforcement do they know that are speaking about some of these issues? I'm, I'm, I'm it. I'm the only one. Yeah. Yeah. No one else. So what, you know, that's, that's my kind of my way of dealing with some of these things. And some of the people that I lost out there is to keep kind of their story and their voice alive. What made you pivot to what you're doing today? It was a complete accident. Um, I gained a reputation working, uh, a, a good one, uh, gladly, uh, uh, I, uh, I had two pieces of advice from my mom and my dad that kept me uh, alive and clean. Uh, my dad said, uh, don't let, don't let anybody own you. So that, that was a pretty powerful piece of advice. I, I took that with me and my mom said, uh, nobody's against you. They're for themselves. So I never took anything personally at work and I never did anything in a personal nature or out of anger or emotion. I just worked and just did my job. Basically that kept me alive. Get, got me a good reputation with the people that I used to work with. I met, I met and befriended members of high level government, uh, in, uh, on, in, in, in Mexico, uh, uh, through some of the work that I did. And, uh, I was always worried about how to be better at my job. Like I was, I wanted to be a professional, basically. I would see the professionalism in others and I wanted to be that. So I would always keep a notebook. If I saw something I'd ever seen before, I would write it down. I would film things. I would uh, interview people. I would debrief uh, cartel members. I would, I would look at how they would set up things and lay out ambushes. Uh, how they would uh, keep uh, detainees that were abducted for uh, abduction for ransom scheme how they would abduct people, that type of stuff. And, uh, and then come up with a uh, training around it, uh, specifically for our guys. And then slowly, but surely some of them would talk or speak about it, or somebody would see it. And, uh, it went from training internally to training people from, uh, some very influential families in Mexico that were wanted to feel safer. Um, some, uh, private entities, and then seeing some American contractors and American government personnel witness some of that training. And, and uh, as soon as I made the leap across the border and uh, started going through my immigration process and becoming a, um, a permanent resident of this beautiful country that is the United States and realizing that the American dream is still alive, at least for people like me, uh, they saw me and said, hey, Ed, what are you doing up here? Uh, 
I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out my life now. You know, on this side. Yeah. Well, come and show us the weird shit that you used to show down there to your people. So, uh, a few companies opened up their doors, including a company called Triple Lock Design out of San Francisco. During the start of my career, uh, basically, hey, you do the classes you used to do down there. Can you do them up here? I said, I don't know if I can. And uh, I do classes almost every weekend. Uh, they're all sold out across the country for the past six, seven years now. Gladly. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, you're in my hometown. I know I messaged you on Instagram. I think right before your last account disappeared yeah. uh, in, near the bubble here. But so people want to find you. So is it Ed Manifesto Podcast now on Instagram? Yeah. Is that, that, that's obviously I watch a lot of the things you share, some of the things you're talking about right now, just the operations tactics that, you know, crime organizations might be doing or just interesting things. So that's a great place I know to find you, which I'll link. But if people are interested in, you know, classes and things like that, where, where do they find you? Uh, www.etsmanifesto.com is our website. That's where my calendar is. That's uh, where a lot of the information uh, as far as the training that we provide. We do consulting. We've worked on a few Hollywood productions as well. We, we do a lot. Uh, there's a few charities that we do as well uh, and work with as far as uh, making things better for some people down in Mexico. So if people want to find out more about our work and the things we're doing, definitely check us out there. Uh, so I'll link all that below. Uh, again, I think it's a lot of, uh, it's really interesting stuff and there's a lot of good, good knowledge and training, especially, you know, if you realize that not everyone in the world is happy and willing to just uh, ignore you and let you live your life. People want to take your things and, break your things on occasion. So it's good to be prepared before we uh, wrap up here. I'm, I'm curious. It's a little bit more of the technical aspect of it again with the drug trade and fentanyl. Cause it seems like that, um, you know, is something that really has popped up in the last few years. And you hear about uh, that killing a lot of people also being really profitable. Can you kind of talk about the rise of fentanyl and, how it's played into it, how deadly it is, or just how has that changed the landscape? What is it? Uh, it's um, you. I first started hearing about it when the legalization of marijuana hit California. Uh, I remember eradicating fields of marijuana just, uh, you know, down south uh, in the early parts of my career. Uh, I remember burning it and uh, wanting M and M's, peanut butter M and M's is usually what I wanted. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would have to we have to burn it in place. So yeah, we we'll take one for the team. We we'll take do? one for the team. Uh, <laughs> later on, that str- later on, you saw the legalization of marijuana in California, and then how it kind of started spreading around. So that became less of a cash cow for cartels, marijuana trafficking. So a lot of those fields were basically replaced with poppy fields. Poppies were, have, have been grown traditionally in Mexico for years. Um, my, my former boss actually talks about it in that podcast episode that I just had with, uh, but uh, not, they, they weren't really that big. And then all of these hillsides started being that were covered in weed were now covered in poppies. Uh, the problem is that uh, they're not as strong a uh, heroin producer as other parts of the world. So it's not as potent. So somebody got the bright idea to lace it with fentanyl somewhere in that uh, mire of uh, mines down there. And they <laughs> it gave it a kick. It gave it a giant kick that was chased by users in the United States. Uh, they quickly realized that the legalization of marijuana did not eat, did not impact the cartels as the people assumed. Uh, not only did it uh, not impact their their uh, business, they actually went into the pot business on the state side. So a lot of these uh, pot companies and grows and stuff like that, and the way they're uh, they're the way they're moving money around, I think, uh, that's all. A lot of cartel involvement in it, throughout it. Uh, Legal pot is being grown in federal lands in California. There's been a few incidents of violence around it as well in the United States. So it didn't work out as planned. All of that fentanyl being laced into the heroin that was now being trafficked 
into the United States right at the tail end of the opiate, uh, the, the prescription opiate epidemic. So it was just a perfect storm. Perfect storm. There was a void. Opiate, prescription opiates were gone. The weed was legal. That wasn't a crop anymore down there. Now it's now it's poppies and let's lace it with fentanyl and just just exploded in popularity. And uh, one thing that people, a lot of people, don't take into account is just the local drug markets in Mexico. Like they are huge as well. So it started being utilized everywhere. Um, the potency of that and the effects it has uh, is hard to measure. So there's nobody, there's no chemist uh, uh, basically down there keeping track of how much fentanyl they are putting into the, the heroin uh, or how much the, the quantities are lacing into these pain medications. So, you know, you'll take one and you won't, you won't come back. Uh, the lacing cocaine with it, uh, lacing other drugs with it now. Uh, so it's, it's basically this upsurge is rise. There was a, manufa there was a manufacturing uh, stop or gap to it. So they couldn't manufacture it that well in Mexico, at least not in the past. A few laboratories were found here and there, but they were usually kind of like a, a pharmaceutical company that was infiltrated by cartel forces or by people, and they were utilizing conventional means of production. Uh, but then, you know, there was an exchange of information from people in China coming to Mexico and basically showing uh, the locals how to cook, how to create, how to manufacture, and how to create this uh the these uh now packaged pills that they sent uh, across the border so it's just uh it's just been an evolutionary process of them kind of figuring out what the best uh crop is and they don't care about the fact that it kills a bunch of people they just care about the fact that it's uh selling and it's making money so that's not a concern for any of them and it's just one element of how they make money so it's not really a big concern in a lot of ways yeah, diversified, I, and that's where. So it it seems right, and like not knowing all, all that much about it, but obviously the Chinese bringing it's probably some resources and and knowledge that have refined that, and then a pure assumption on my part, right? Like what's what's in it for them? Uh, obviously, if money is being laundered back through China, like obviously there's an advantage there, but you got to wonder if like that's even. Uh, if it's it's a drop in the hat compared to what they're doing with manufacturing, yeah. Uh, and uh, if you ask, I mean, if you ask if you ask the Chinese if they're at war with the United States, they'll say yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a great way to help continue to sow dissent and um, yeah, tear apart the fabric of society. Yeah, you know, just it's one variable, one aspect of of the fight there. That's kind of if anybody at. wants to read further, just get a just read this if you want uh there's a lot of uh there's a lot of information out there as far as uh you know some of the ways that i mean the chinese think about things in a very big long-term aspect so the slow degradation of your youth and uh through the use of opiates and basically killing off a whole generation of, uh, of people is very much within the confines of their of the Chinese Communist Party's perception of what unrestricted warfare is. So, I mean, the U.S. might not realize or doesn't want to talk about that fact, but it's very much the, the China is very much at war with the United States. We hear the things just like TikTok and the algorithm that they do, you know, and if you ask Chinese youth what they want to be, like predominantly it's astronaut, scientist, engineer, right? And in America, it's youth want to be an influencer or just have no aspirations. And that's all part of it. I mean, it's, it's all these puzzle pieces coming together. It's not just one thing, but you start adding all these up. And like you mentioned, right, we can't pass a budget. The Chinese think in a very long strategic plan. They have it road mapped out. So you look at all these things coming together. Um, it's, it's pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. If you want to knock down, I have enemy. great hope for North America. I think if we can figure out a way to speak to each other, I mean, we, like, when I say we, I mean, the United States and Mexico have so much potential. Both our countries have so much potential. If we could just figure out a way to work together, uh, you, the, the, the peso is one of the strongest currencies on the planet right now, you know, which is, think about it, you know, um, 
the investments coming into Mexico, uh, the lithium <laughs> that it has underneath its uh, its uh, its ground, um, the youth it has, the people that want to work, people want to better their lives. Mexico is already in a lot of ways intermingled with the United States through marriages, blood, relationships. Right. Uh, Americans are living in Mexico at an all-time high. I think it's uh, 90% of all new housing in places like Tijuana are being bought up by Americans. So, like, we're already, you know, the border means something to some people, but really doesn't mean a lot to many people. What's what's that fix to you? I, I, obviously, you immigrated, um, became a citizen. How difficult a process was that for you? What is the fix like? How, how, how I mean, do you do? Uh, it was a horribly difficult difficult process. And I had uh, my daughter's American. That is, uh, she's a third generation American. So, okay. and I, in my mind, I never imagined that I was going to migrate to the United States. That wasn't in the, that wasn't in the cards for me in my mind, but, but then, you know, <laughs> things went South down South. So I had to look for options. Um, the process was not easy at all. I had a legitimate claim to it and it was not easy. You know, uh, there's, uh, the immigration system itself is broken in a lot of ways. Um, uh, people that have something to offer the United States. I mean, I've been, I've spoken to Congress, uh, congressional committees and stuff like that in the United States, uh, but uh, my immigration process lasted two years. And which is probably fast by most by that. Uh, it was it was pretty long and arduous and I uh, have had a lot of questions asked several times of me and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot a, a lot of stuff happened that uh, was pretty demoralizing for somebody going through that process yeah. uh, specifically seeing other people from other countries getting a free pass right um or uh, people from my own country uh coming through illegally and figuring out a, a, a regulatory path later on so it's it's it's, it's wild um there is definitely uh there's definitely this notion that a lot of people have that uh once you once you immigrate into the United States as a Mexican, you're like against immigration. You know, you're the old, you're that's a, that you turn into like yeah, like I'm I'm in the U.S. now. Close the border. Needed, like, which is I, I get that, I, I get that, I got the, I get that feeling. And uh, but you, if you look at the reality of uh, as as far as what people are supporting when it comes to Ill illegal immigration. You know, I, I understand the whole aspect of, hey, there, there, there's no such thing as legal immigration. We're all legal, you know, no borders and all that. I, I get that. But realistically, when you when you talk about open borders or, le or, or like, uh, just fucking let them through, they're all going to get taxed anyway. So you're supporting a criminal enterprise that is like nothing that the world has ever seen before. You're supporting murderous, murderers. You're supporting fucking abductors. You're supporting a clear terrorist organizations on the border. When you when you speak about that, and you're also supporting an industry and a and a process that claims and eats people on, on that are on their way up to the border through some of these uh, uh, smuggling routes. You know, you can't be a woman going through all that process and not be raped. And this is what people support. Ah, yeah, yeah, come on, just you know. And when I speak against. Uh, this type of immigration. This is what I speak up against: uh, the people that are making money hand over fist with humanity and how they treat them, and are in a lot of ways turning a lot of these people into slaves. And it's fascinating that the uh, certain political spectrum in the in, in in the United States defends this. You know, it's. It's a, it's a weird, it's like speaking as, speaking as an immigrant myself, because I'm an immigrant, I went right. through my immigrant, immigrant, immigration process, uh, during the election of Donald Trump. So <laughs> super, super easy. Super easy. No, <laughs> nobody yelled anything at me. Nobody felt emboldened to call me, call, call, to call me, uh, a bunch of, uh, racial <laughs> stuff and, uh, Open arms. But at the end of it, 
Um, I still came to this country without a lot. Uh, and I worked as soon as I could. And I, I could tell you that, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm an immigrant. I'm hungry. I have this worth ethic on my end. Like I, I came here with nothing and now I have a company with, uh, three employees. Um, so it's, if you work for it, it's here. Um, if you do the work, it's here. And, uh, I, that doesn't mean I've forgotten about where I'm from or where I come from. Like I have a few kids that we, we were sponsoring as far as their professional fighting careers in Mexico right now. Uh, that's awesome. We've paid for eye operations and uh, schooling of a few of the orphans left behind from the conflicts that I was a part of. Not not just on the, on the side of uh, former uh, ch children of law enforcement uh, people that I work with, but also some of the criminals that I went after. Uh, I have a podcast where I speak to people constantly uh, that were instrumental in my formation, and I'm sharing them with other people now. Uh, from the, my former boss, Lizaola, to Conejo, the 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 guy that uh, the the, uh, the the guy we arrested on murder charges in Tijuana and deported back to the United States, which was funny as hell, to now be friends with, you know, and our kids know each other. It, it's it's wild, uh, but the uh, like I'm living proof that the immigration system can work for some. You know, and there are good people that want to come to this country and make a difference and figure things out. But I'm also an example of how it's really flawed and how there's a there's a there's this, this there's these unrealistic standards of what it takes to come to this country and, 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 and be a productive citizen here and how some people don't follow that aren't coming here for the right reasons, I guess, is what I would say. Um, I have had the privilege of sharing my experiences and, and, and some of the training I do with high level government uh, officials in the U S uh, and in Mexico. And I love both countries and I am a son of Mexico, but I'm an adopted son of the United States now. So I'm trying to figure out how to make things better on both sides. That puts me in a weird position, you know, because realistically, politically right now, both of those countries are enemies. That's crazy. So, and I don't know um, how how you fix that. You know, the easy. I mean, you tie economically, like as you talked about before, the resources between the two. That's your fix. But how do you get to that point when everything is politicized based on one party's, you know, for or against, and they're going to weaponize basically humanity, right, for stirring the pot for. A broad brush. Uh, alternative media helps. Be uh, speaking about it helps. Uh, I've been on some of the biggest podcasts on the planet a few times, uh, and spoke about it. Putting my people, that, people again, things that people don't realize about some of these things. I'm not, I'm not only putting my my reputation on the line. I'm also putting my life on the line. Speaking about some of these things. Yep. Um, and I, every now and then, people online online can be horrible. The best piece of advice I ever had was uh, don't read the comment section. <laughs> Joe, 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 <laughs> Joe told me that one. Uh, but uh, they they tell me, well, uh, Ed, like, if you're such a badass, like, why'd you leave? Why'd you flee? You know? Like, why'd you stay down there and fight? You know, all the shit you talk about. Well, you know, we, you know, those that can't do teach or those that can't uh, fight anymore will speak about it, I guess. Uh, I haven't forgotten about where I haven't forgotten the people that I used to work with. I haven't forgotten the problems that I faced. I haven't forgotten some of the bullshit the government did down there. And uh, if anything, I am still trying to figure out how to fight in different ways for the place that I that I came out of. And uh, that doesn't mean that my life is not in danger anymore. You know, there's always risks. Um, and uh, I think. Uh, there's a lot of attention being put on foreign wars, Ukraine, Asia, other parts of the world. I think the United States has a very, very solid bet if it bets on Mexico and if it could figure out a way to regularize relationships with it and cut this cartel problem. 
at its root on both sides of the border because it's a problem that is it's not a Mexican problem, it's a regional problem. The cartels are an American like like an example of this. The Sinaloa cartel is not from Sinaloa. The Sinaloa cartel was born in Los Angeles. You know, so that's how people should start thinking about this problem. How how is that? Explain that to me, because that that is, uh, the Sinaloa cartel traditionally has been run by a single individual, at, at least at the top, by the name of El Mayo Zambada. El Mayo Zambada learned his tradecraft as far as trafficking, moving things, uh, knowing about smuggling operations and things like of this nature. Uh, he learned a lot of these things by uh, from a former CIA operative uh, that was part of the Bay of the Pig invasions back in the uh, back in the day. So that's where he, that's where he, that, this is somebody who we learned some of this craft by. And then he went back to Mexico and started one of the most powerful and most influential criminal or, organizations on the planet. So you, you, it makes you wonder who he is and what his uh, ties are. But uh, it also makes it clear that the, the situation with cartels and how they've grown in influence and how they do their thing is not a Mexican phenomenon or problem. It's a regional problem of the United States and Mexico. We have a lot of users. They have people that are willing to supply. Um, we, on one hand, send millions of dollars worth of money down to Mexico for them to fight cartel problems. But then I go to Seattle and I get uh, a box with a crack pipe and needles so like i remember just having this experience of being up there and just seeing that and i'm like we have a problem you know we have a we have this we have a problem we don't we're, we don't uh we're not all on the same page and we're not all logically thinking about this problem as a community which we are you know man yeah there's so much to dig apart here some of the things too that are kind of interesting that ties to that that now you see from like the early eighties, you know, things that get portrayed in movies where obviously the American government fighting the Soviets and the Soviets, you know, influence in various parts of the world in South America, who, you know, the sides they would pick and then bolster up while, Hey, we're going to look the other way while you're doing whatever it is over here. Uh, so that, you know, we can make sure this government that's going to be, a communist sympathizer doesn't get in place. And, you know, it's like a, a criminal organization is born or bolstered uh, to support the needs at that moment for that administration. And then the tides change and it just keeps going you know, so back and the, forth. The, the, the concept of cartels being a Mexican problem, change it. The concept of cartels not being in the U S yet to build a border wall really high, to cut immigration, to close the borders, all that's nonsense. Uh, you know, the gang violence was most specifically probably lowered by Sinaloa cartel presence in the United States and then shutting down and killing some of the competition in the U.S. That's probably what happened. Um, so the concept of this being something you see on the news happening in Mexico uh, while you're in your apartment in Seattle and seeing dude die outside your your luxury apartment on a uh, OD on fentanyl by, by a, a needle that was supplied by the federal government grants uh, given to them by the current administration. That type of shit is, but you should kind of like uh, really do some soul searching, soul searching uh, on our end. And also when you go to the Chipotle and buy uh, extra guac on your burrito, that is, that is pay, putting money in the pockets of a cartel members down South. Uh, uh, some of the produce that you're eating in your salad and stuff like that, that's probably picked by somebody that's, who's, who's an endangered sla slavery in a way somewhere in the United States while you're uh, putting a Black Lives Matter sticker on your business so it doesn't uh, get its window broken. You know, this is this is this is, this is a lot of shit that we need to kind of, kind of figure out as a country. Oh, man, it's the same thing of, you know, complain about uh people who hate capitalism and they're doing that as they're on their iPhone and sipping a Starbucks. You're like, you really don't understand here. Um, man, Ed, what you're doing is really important. I know just listen to you on a couple of different podcasts for me is really, it was eye opening, fascinating. 
and just to hear kind of the straight talk. So the message that you're going out there and the information you're providing, I think is invaluable. And I know, as you mentioned, there's obviously risk that comes with doing that. So I think it is really important. Hopefully uh, you keep sharing uh, this information and it opens, opens people's eyes and minds to some of the things that are really going on out there. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, the, the clear need for an open conversation about this is already at a high level. You're hearing Congress talk about it. I recently spoke to a few members of Congress myself. I've talked to a few Senate here uh, and a few uh, Senate committees about some of these issues myself. And it's coming to a point where all of us as a nation and all of us as a region will have to make some hard decisions. And, uh, uh, you can put the uh, Ukrainian flag on your profile picture if you want. Do all that stuff. Uh, think about uh, and worry about wars that are happening across the sea. But uh, if if war does break out regionally here and there's some sort of conflict, uh, military conflict uh, on the border uh, with Mexico, uh, the ability of that affecting your day to day is going to be very present, clear. This is not a forum. This is not. Uh, this is not going to be Afghanistan and Iraq. You can't send a bunch of drones down there and think it's not going to. Re- there's the repercussions of that are not going to be felt in the United States. We're close. We're neighbors. We're family in a lot of ways. So, I think a, a long, hard conversation has to be had in the U.S. And people should be conscientious about the fact that that's going to be a very expensive conflict if it doesn't get resolved before we get to that. Hopefully it doesn't get to that. And again, having these conversations and getting that out there sparks it with people who can actually make decisions and make impacts. Um, Yeah, it's serious stuff. There's, uh, there's so many, there's so many pieces here that impact every, every single individual's life, you know, North and South of the border and, and beyond that. So as I wrap up and I always ask my guests, if you found 15, 16 year old, you walking down the street is there any advice you would give him? Tell him to do something different. And so I'll let you think about that for a minute because I know I want to, if you're willing to hang around after this for a There I Was story, uh, that's for my Patreon supporters and Apple Podcast subscribers that keep the lights on. Uh, if you'll hang around for that, once we, we finish up with that softball of a question, is there any advice you'd give old 15 or 16-year-old Ed? Whew. Yeah, easy. <laughs> uh... You're where you need to be. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change anything. Actually, uh, whatever happened happened, and it led me to a life where I had my eight-year-old, uh, uh, eight-year-old perform a small act of kindness and express some medical skills. Uh, with an injured five-year-old and all of that happened because I went through what I went through and she's here and she's making at least that little bit of a change of difference in her universe. So I'd say keep going. I'd say you're, you're where you need to be. Love it. Ed, thanks for joining me on the podcast. It was a pleasure being able to talk to you. Hopefully, uh, I actually get to go to one of your classes if you're over this way again. Uh, it'd be it'd be great to link up in person and and, and just learn I'll, a little I'll, bit more. I'll definitely be out. Uh, Solutions Group International out in Riverside. Great people. We'll definitely be back out there. Perfect. Awesome, Ed. I'll talk Thank to you, you soon.